Welcome to the first Inclusion Fusion Web Summit on Special Needs Ministry brought to you by Key Ministry and PajamaConference.com. My name is Shannon Dingle and I am thrilled to present today on the topic of common misconceptions about special needs ministry. I currently am the Access Ministry Coordinator at Providence Baptist Church in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I write the special needs ministry blog theworksofgoddisplayed.com and contribute to a pre-K through 12th grade Sunday school curriculum um, that also has an element that connects church and home and that is called Treasure in Christ and can be found at treasureinchristonline.com. All the notes for this presentation as well as the one other that I'm presenting at this conference, Disability, the Sanctity of Life and the Church, can be found at the Inclusion Fusion website as well as on my blog. For this session, un instead of filming as if we were at a typical conference and I was standing in front of a room of people, I wanted to recognize that this is a little different. So I am here on my couch in the comfort of my own home talking to you as if we're having a conversation. And I even have my trusty cup of coffee beside me. I hope that you too are in a comfortable place with your favorite beverage to drink. The one problem with this approach though is that you are not getting to contribute to this conversation in a typical way. It's, it's a little one-sided. So what I would like to ask of you right now, take a moment to jot down my email address and I would love to be in touch after the session to make it a two-sided conversation. My email is shannon at theworksofgoddisplayed.com. I'd love to email with you, possibly connect by phone. And if you are in or will be in the Raleigh, North Carolina area, I would love the opportunity if we're able to work it out to connect in person as well. I love nothing more than to sit and chat about disability ministry because God has just placed a passion in my heart for this area of ministry. Now before we dive into the common misconceptions about disability ministry in the church, let's take a moment to pray and then to discuss why it even matters, why this topic is relevant at all. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity to present. Please give um, me your wisdom and your words so that your people may be equipped to welcome all of your people into your church. In your name we pray. Okay, so if we're doing God's work in welcoming and including people with disabilities in our churches, does it matter if some of what we're doing is misguided or if some of the foundations of what we're doing are a little off, even though, even if, if what we're doing is good, does it matter what those foundations are, if those are myths or misconceptions? It matters. It matters because truth matters, and furthermore, because God is truth. We learn in Jesus' words in John 14, verse 6, that I am the way and the truth and the life. You see, God isn't just about truth. He is truth. And Jesus goes on to say, no one comes to the Father except through me. Because God is truth, we learn in Hebrews 6, 18 and in Titus that it is impossible for God to lie. And in John 8, verses 31 to 32, Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, in John 8, 44, we see the opposite, that Satan lies and is in fact the father of lies. More than 100 verses in the Bible speak directly against the sin of lying because truth matters. And it matters that we operate in truth because the word tells us that we are God's ambassadors. To those who don't know God and don't know the church, not only do we lack credibility and dishonesty if we reflect Christ poorly, but also in their eyes we can make God appear less credible. Praise God that he can overcome our flawed representations of him, but let's do our best to represent him well. And even the slightest misconceptions or myths, things that are not true, can be dangerous. According to Luke 16, verse 10, one who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. In Psalm 40, verse 4, 
we hear encouragement and warning. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. If we love God, then we must love truth and desire to convey truth in our special needs ministries and in all of our ministries and everything we do in the church and outside of the church as we represent him. One of the biggest errors that I see in disability ministry among those with great passion for service and great love for the people of God is a tendency to operate out of a love for people instead of out of a love for God. I'll return to that thought in the end, but just know that, um, that, that we'll be getting there and I'll be wrapping up with that. But let me start with an example. For the past year and a half, I have been searching for a source for a statistic that I've heard again and again in special needs ministry, ministry presentations and seen in written resources. That statistic has motivated many to go into special needs ministry. It's that 80% of parents who have a child with a disability in some versions, I've heard a child with autism, 80% of those marriages will end in divorce. Now that's what I've heard. That's what I've seen written. If you Google it, lots of hits come up. However, I've not found one single source for that. And in fact, the statistics and research that I have found either show no higher incidence of divorce for families who have a disability or as much as maybe twice as, uh, as, as much of a risk of divorce. But even then, in one of the studies for uh, kid, families who had a child with autism, the divorce rate was about 25%, a far cry from 80%. Before I, I dive further into that, let me sit, tell you that I've heard it often enough that I feel like it came from somewhere and I don't think it's an intentional lie. If you can tell me the original source, not just a book or speaker or website that quotes the 80% figure, but that actually points to the study or research that led to that. If you can find it and point it out to me, I would love to be proved wrong. Email me at shannon at theworksofgoddisplayed.com and I will get some sort of prize out to you for solving the, pro the, the puzzle I've been working on for a year and a half. I don't think it's out there though. And, and I think what happened is that somebody said something offhand, not meant to be a, a true statistic uh, or, or something based in research and other people took it and as it got retold and retold and retold, some things got twisted, kind of like the game telephone where you whisper in people's ears and it's something different by the end. And it, then it becomes accepted, even if it's not ac accurate, especially if it is repeated by those with credibility. As more and more churches engage in special needs ministry, we need to take time to dispel some of the most common myths. In this session, we'll discuss common misconceptions and half-truths that are at times accepted in disability ministries and in churches across the country. And I also will leave you with some practical tools and tips to use in your church. Not an exhaustive list and not absolutely everything that you could consider, but enough that should get you off to a great start. Now, the first misconception that we are going to deal with today is that disability ministry is children's ministry. Now, while there is a bit of truth to that in that most churches that do disability ministry and that have programs for that do begin in children's ministry, that's not where we're meant to stop because you see, they grow up. For most kids who have a disability, particularly those who would need extra assistance from um, members of your congregation or from a designated ministry in your church to be included in your children's ministry programs, most of those kids will become adults who might need some extra assistance or additional supports to be included in your adult ministries. Most disabilities that we're looking at in the church, the ones that would require that little extra bit of support or consideration, aren't ones that kids outgrow, although there are disabilities that children do outgrow. And they um, aren't, though in some cases uh, this happens, they aren't disabilities that would prevent adulthood, that is, that would shorten a lifespan so much that a child would never grow up 
and would die before they reached adulthood. That happens, but once again, that's not the norm. Most things we're looking at when we're talking about autism, when we're talking about Down syndrome, when we're talking about a variety of other disabilities, children with that disability become adults with that disability. And it is dishonest if we say we want to include people with disabilities and then we kick them out when they turn 18. Maybe not overtly kick them out, but once there's no longer a place for them, we cannot expect that they will continue to come or feel welcome. It is a good place to start. And so my first action step for you is to start wherever the greatest need is. And many churches that I've spoken to have found that children's ministry is that, that starting place in which the need is most obvious and most pressing. But don't stop there. My second tip for you is to plan for short, short term, which once again may be children's ministry, but also for long term which should eventually include adults if it doesn't in your short-term plan. Then third, one other consideration you have to keep in mind is that special needs ministry with adults requires a different approach at times. Let me give you three examples of that. First, instead of working primarily with parents, you will be interacting with some parents, some group homes, some other caregivers, some people with disabilities themselves who, who get to church on their own without the involvement of any of those other folks. So it's not just mom and dad, which leads to my second example of how things are different. You may need to figure out how volunteers from your church can provide transportation because mom and dad aren't gonna be the ones driving an adult with disabilities in all situations. And the third example is that if you have any individuals with aggressive behavior or elopement, that is the act of wandering off or running away, that's more difficult to handle when you're working with a grown man versus when you're working with a three-year-old boy, for example. Now I share those differences with you not to scare you off, but to equip you to have a safe ministry. Prepare in truth and trust God to do a mighty work in your church so that you may include all of those with disabilities and not just children. Our second misconception today is that you don't need to bother until you have someone with special needs come to your church. Could it be that if you don't have anyone with a disability in your church, that perhaps you are unintentionally creating an environment in which they are not welcome? Consider this, stairs are what make a building inaccessible, not the wheelchair, nor the person in the wheelchair. You see, the problem isn't with the person. If it were, then you wouldn't need to do anything until that person showed up because the problem wouldn't be present until that moment. The arrival of someone with special needs is not what makes a church inaccessible. It just reveals the inaccessibility that is already there. To think about this scenario, one in which a church has no people with disabilities, let's consider three questions. First, would you start a church with no children's ministry, even if the founding members or church planting team did not include any families that had children? Or would you plan for children to come and reach out to families in that community to invite them in? Second question, do you have people with disabilities in your community? Now that one's sort of a trick question because I can already tell you that the answer is yes. 19% of Americans have a disability. Now that group, 54.4 million people, is about the same size as the combined populations of Florida and California. And 13% of Americans have a disability that would be considered severe. One in six children has a developmental disability. People with disabilities are in your community. If they aren't in your church, then you ought to ask, why not? Now, the third question for you is this. Do you want to share the gospel with everyone in your community, or do you want to limit who has access to your body of believers? Some churches communicate this to their members. Please invite your friends to join us next week, and by friends, 
we mean those who would fit well behaviorally and physically and emotionally in our congregation. If you would like a complete list of who we actually don't want you to invite, please see one of our ushers at the end. You don't want to say, here is the good news, that Jesus Christ came to earth fully God and fully man and lived the sinless life that we could not live and died the sinner's death that we deserved and rose from the dead to conquer death that we may live for him with him forever. And this good news is only for people who are just like me. That's not true. And we shouldn't act that way. We should see special needs ministry as a missions ministry because this is a people group that has largely been forgotten by the church. So what can you do? First action step that I want to suggest is do not assume that you don't have anyone with disabilities in your church. I'll give you a quick story. We had a situation once where a child had been having a rough time every Sunday for over a year. Finally, after a few years of struggling, the parents finally trusted us after class one day to say, well, he was diagnosed with autism a few years ago. Perhaps families aren't sharing with you about a diagnosed disability because they don't trust that you would receive that information well and support them instead of shunning them. Your second action step as you're considering that would be to contact disability related organizations in your community to find out where the greatest needs are and to find out what training they might not be able to offer to your volunteers. Third, ask people in your church to invite their friends, their neighbors, their loved ones who have disabilities or who have children with disabilities to come to your church. Fourth, actively engage in outreach to invite people with disabilities in. One way you can do that is to partner with local organizations to go where they are. If it's an autism awareness walk, for example, offer to hand out water bottles that have a message on them that invites and welcomes people to join you that coming Sunday. Another option would be to host your own outreach event. At our church, we have a large scale prom event for teens and adults, many of whom missed out on a typical prom experience in high school. Another thing that we do is respite care events in which parents of children with disabilities are able to bring that child and any siblings and we provide three hours of care for them on a Saturday afternoon so that the parents can have the gift of time other churches do respite care in a variety of other ways, so you don't have to follow that exact model. But those are two examples of effective outreaches that our church has engaged in to invite people with disabilities to join us and to be a part of us and what we do. And finally, you can access some accessibility inventories. I know Johnny and Friends on their website offers one, and there are some disability ministry books that have those inventories included so that you can evaluate how your church is doing, and I'll include a list of those books in my notes. The third misconception that I often hear in disability ministry is that you must use one particular model or even that you must have a formalized program with a name and a coordinator and all that fancy stuff before it is considered to be a ministry for people and with people with disabilities. What matters most is that you welcome people with disabilities and what it looks like will vary given what church you're at. So, what model should you use if you're in a position where you're beginning a ministry at your church? It depends. I know, I know that there is ambiguity in that statement that can be frustrating, but it's true. You see, most churches start with a disability ministry and children's ministry. It's more rare to start with adults, but that's what Providence did successfully 10 years ago, and others have done that as well. Many churches provide respite events to give parents the gift of time. Others host large prom events for their adults and teens. 
Some have support groups for parents or siblings or people with disabilities themselves. Some connect with outside organizations to co-sponsor events. Some group most kids with special needs into separate classes while others practice inclusion and still others have a mix. Some churches feel called to reach out to those with more obvious special needs while others are really drawn to those who have more hidden disabilities. But here's my point. There is no perfect model. So if there's not a perfect model, what can you do? First, consider the needs in your church. Second, I have found that in children's ministry particularly, most churches start well with inclusion. A model in which children with special needs are supported in their typical age or grade classes with the support of a one-on-one -on -one volunteer because that allows those churches to focus on the needs of the specific children and not bother, at least not initially, with having a classroom or special curricula for that separate class. Take a warning there that that's what I've seen work in most cases but it's not the perfect plan for all churches. My third tip for you is to discuss what models you could possibly have in special needs ministry in light of the other structures already existing in your church, as well as in light of any individual needs for adults and children with disabilities who are already present in your congregation. I would recommend that you check out Rebecca Hamilton's session in this conference for some tips on particular models that you might want to consider. Fourth, you need to be willing to adapt if you have a child or adult with disabilities who arrives and doesn't quite fit your mold for ministry. It may mean that you need to change that mold or create a whole new one. And God will give you wisdom to know what step you need to take at that point. The fourth misconception that I often come across in disability ministry is that you need a special education professional in order to do special needs ministry. I do have a master's degree in special education and yes I taught for about four years and yes I used to work for an educational nonprofit creating training materials for special educators. And yes all of that does help me coordinate the special needs ministry at our church. but. You don't have to have prior experience related to special education to do this. Sure, it can help, but I know many effective leaders in special needs ministry who had no experience before they jumped into it. And on that same note, it does not have to be a staff member. Some churches have large staffs that can accommodate someone specifically on staff for disability ministry. Others, only have a pastor and no one else on staff and there's ones that fall all along the, the continuum in between. I've served at churches on each end of the continuum as well as churches right smack in the middle. I'm a volunteer at my current church and I love what I get to do and I'm willing to pour myself into it because I have a great passion for it and because I have the opportunity to be a stay-at-home mom to my two children during the day as I volunteer in this ministry to coordinate it. So here's a list of my must-haves for a special needs ministry coordinator. First, a belief that it matters, that people with disabilities should be taught in the church and equipped to serve within the church. Second, a willingness to do hard things because it's not always easy, even though it is always worth it. Third, a desire to partner with parents with humility and to learn from them. And fourth, a resourceful approach to networking with others who know more in other churches, in uh, social agencies and nonprofits, in the public school system or private schools, and on the internet. The other reason that it's not crucial to have someone with a special education or a disability related background is that my prior experience is not always helpful. For example, when I was first coordinating our ministry, I had the opportunity to meet one of our moms in the hallway in passing on Sunday morning. I introduced myself to her and as I shared about my, a little about my background with her, I unintentionally made myself seem like the great expert instead of a servant humbly seeking information from her about her child. 
I always intend to be a student of our families to learn from them and I, I just wasn't in this instance. She saw that and she made it pretty clear that she didn't appreciate it. It was not my finest moment. And thankfully, she and I have recovered from that moment. But I pointed out to demonstrate that knowledge and experience can be a curse rather than a blessing if it isn't tempered with humility and a James 119 attitude. That is slow, quick to listen and slow to speak. So in short, my answer to you is this on this misconception. I am not great and my qualifications are not great. God is great. I am not the guiding force in our ministry and neither are you in yours. God is. What action steps can you take? First, remember that God qualifies the called rather than calling the qualified in many examples throughout scripture. Secondly, build a team perhaps drawing from several members of a team instead of finding all of the qualities of a, a great special needs ministry leader in just one person. You could assemble a few together to lead the ministry. And you should have a partnership among uh, more than just one person to make this work well. Third, include parents because their insights are crucial, but don't expect them to run it. Special needs ministry isn't just about the child or adult with special needs, it's about their whole family. And if a parent wants to serve, by all means let them. We have two faithful moms who like to serve alongside their children in their classes, but don't force parents to do it if they need a break or if they feel called to serve elsewhere. Fourth, partner with professionals in your area to tap into secular training and resources about disability. Though be cautious to base your, disability, or your ministry on the wisdom of God rather than the knowledge of man. You don't have to have a professional to run this. The next misconception that often comes up a little further into the conversation, not usually the first misconception given um, when I'm talking to churches, is that it's just too hard, or even the flip side, that it's easy. Many churches agree that welcoming people with disabilities is a good aim, but they think that it's too much effort or too hard for them to pull it off. It's too hard. It requires too much. It hasn't been done here before. I hear those things. But consider this, was the act of salvation too hard? Did the cross require too much? Had God sacrificing himself for his people on their behalf ever been done before? Did even the disciples trust that Christ had what it took to defeat death and the grave as they mourned in hiding the day before he rose again? We are an Easter people y'all every day is a great day to remember in light of special needs ministry and every other aspect of our lives that god deals in the impossible he excels in it if you could do it on your own you wouldn't need him don't camp out on the saturday before the resurrection limited by your understanding of the present reality Live and serve and rejoice in Sunday, in the complete lack of limitations on our God. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. We read in Matthew 28, 6. Now on the flip side, don't treat it like it's nothing or fail to prepare. The church has let down people with disabilities in the past by treating them as sinners or demon-possessed or unworthy of God. Don't promise something with an advertised ministry if you're not planning to do it right. So, your action steps. Study God's Word and you'll see that He doesn't call us to do easy things. Second, don't buy into the lie that we were designed for comfort or health, or wealth, or prosperity, or that God's chief aim is to bless us in material ways. That's watered down Americanized Christianity at best, and blasphemy at worst. Third, don't say you're willing, willing to, rec or to welcome people with disabilities if you're not. That's a lie. 
You have to be willing to get messy and sacrificial and feel ill-equipped to do this, but there is also great blessing. I have been puked on, spat upon, bruised, hit with flying markers, and bitten in disability ministry. It is hard, but it is right and it is worth it. Fourth, don't recruit volunteers by promising them that it will be easy. You, can't prom you can promise your support and help and partnership, but you can't say that it won't be hard because that's not honest and because your volunteers will not last if they're lured with false promises. Yeah, sometimes it's hard and sometimes it's not hard, but both of those points are irrelevant to whether or not you should do it. Another misconception about disability ministry is that it's just another program. It's easy nowadays for churches to become all about programs. In the words of Jason Stellman in the book Dual Citizens, the first question pastors often hear from visitors to their churches concerns programs. Do you have a young married couples ministry? How about an alcoholics recovery program? What activities does your youth ministry offer? And, do you have anything for my green-eyed, left-handed preteen daughter who loves ferrets and plays the oboe? The assumption seems to be that since the church is primarily a means for social interaction, it should provide the Christian versions of whatever club or subculture we feel drawn to, no matter how narrow or age-specific. I understand why churches are hesitant to become programmatic and cater to every subgroup in their congregation, lest the body of Christ be segregated and the gospel get buried under all those programs. And while this is certainly a valid concern, special needs ministry simply can't be likened to another program or to a program for green-eyed, left-handed preteen girls who love ferrets and play the oboe. Why not? Well, for one, those green-eyed, left-handed preteen, ferret-loving, oboe-playing girls can participate in other programs. They can worship with others. You know, the right-handers with brown and blue eyes. They can understand the gospel as it is shared with everyone else, and they can serve within the church. Can individuals with special needs do those things at your church? Some can, depending on the extent to which their disabilities affect them, but many cannot at most churches. My role as Special Needs Ministry Coordinator at our church isn't to create new programs. It's to identify barriers to ministry for these families and to remove those. Special Needs Ministry isn't a new silo of ministry in your church. It's about making sure that every part of your church is accessible and welcoming. So, what actions can I suggest? First, meet with different ministry leaders at your church to discuss how disability ministry can be a part of what they do. Second, examine every aspect of what your church does to figure out where barriers are to full involvement for people with disabilities, and then work with and in submission to other leaders to destroy those barriers. It's not a program, it's a mission. The next myth in disability ministry is one of the most dangerous. The myth is that it is about ministering to people with disabilities. You might be wondering what's wrong about that statement. Here's the thing, it's a good start, but it's only a start. Your aim and my aim, the aim should be ministry with or alongside those with special needs. Our goal is not simply to minister to them. Throughout the Bible, it is made clear that God has uniquely gifted each of us according to his perfect purpose. We see that in 1 Corinthians 12, in Romans 12 verses 3 through 8, and in Ephesians 4 verses 1 through 16. 1 Peter 4.10 states, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. And this verse does not exclude those with disabilities, nor do the ones I mentioned earlier. 
we do not aim to simply minister to children, youth, and adults with special needs. We want to encourage them in their areas of giftedness and provide opportunities for them to serve as well because they are vital members of the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, which is the church. Their stories and testimonies matter as much as anyone else's, as much as yours, as much as mine, as much as any person in your congregation and in the body of Christ. My friend Lucy, who cannot hear, wrote these words in a guest post for my blog. It is true that I cannot do everything, but I can trust that the Lord will equip me to do the things he has called me to do for my good and his glory. On a practical note, here are a few examples of ways you can engage in ministry with people with disabilities and not just ministry to them. First, if a class, Sunday school class, is involved in a missions or service project, the kids and students and adults with special needs in that class should be involved too. Second, on most Sunday mornings at our church, at least one of the greeters at the door, welcoming people, handing out bulletins, that sort of thing, is a member of our joy class. That's our separate class of adults with special needs. One member of the joy class regularly reads the Bible story to one of our first grade Sunday school classes, and I then accompany her back to her class. A third consideration uh, for action is to find or create opportunities in which families of those with special needs can encourage one another. I've seen churches do this, or we've done this as well, with social activities, parents or siblings, support groups, and Bible studies. Fourth, as you get to know people with disabilities at your church and learn about their passions and gifts, help them figure out where they could serve in your church. You could use um, spiritual gifts inventories or just a simple conversation to help them explore what the options are in your congregation and what their gifts are and how those can match up. And if you do have a separate class for kids or adults with disabilities, make sure that you take time to present opportunities about where the members of that class can serve the body of Christ that is the church and don't assume that they can't or that they won't. The eighth misconception in disability ministry is that it's optional. I know that there's some folks who disagree with me on this. Another disability ministry blogger who I respect wrote that the aim of that blog is to equip those who have been called to special needs ministry, but not to call others to do it because that's God's job. And while I agree that God is the one who does the calling and ultimately the equipping, I have to disagree somewhat because yes, it is God who calls us to him and calls us to ministry and equips us for it, for it, but it is inaccurate to imply that some churches are called to welcome those with disabilities and others aren't. God's word is clear that the gospel, his gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ is for all people. And if we limit it to just some, then we are acting in sin. If your church refuses to preach the gospel to certain people groups, such as the group of people with disabilities in your midst, or certain ethnic or socioeconomic groups, if you're refusing to allow access to the gospel to all people in your community, then you need to repent. My husband's and my chief desire is for our children, Robbie, age two, and Jocelyn, age four, to treasure Christ. We still plan to adopt three or four children so that we may end up with a family of, of six kids. And so let's use that as an example. It would never occur to us to choose one child of six to ignore while we focus on the other five to disciple in God's word and encourage in using their gifts. That would be abusive and absurd for us to say, okay, this one child, we're setting you over here and let's focus on talking to Jesus about the other five and modeling Christ for them. It would be Ne it would send a negative message to not only the one child who we set aside, but to the five children who we preach the gospel to while obviously ignoring their sixth sibling. 
that's what many churches do every week. A study in May 2011 shows that one in six children in the U.S. has a developmental disability. Is your church setting aside the one child and just focusing on the five in every six kids? In 1 Corinthians 12, verses 24 and 25, we learn that God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for one another. When Christ invited the children to come to the, Him, He didn't stipulate that only the ones with the correct number of chromosomes ought to come, or the ones with church-appropriate behavior. Our desire in our church is that every child treasures Christ and we're not comfortable picking and choosing which children and youth and adults have that opportunity. So what can you do? First step, simple. Something. Do something. Take that first step, whatever it may be, at your church to make your church a more welcoming place for people with disabilities. Second, resolve that if someone with a disability comes to your church, you will not turn them away or be a stumbling block to their faith. It's not optional, not if we believe God's word to be true. The final misconception that I want to focus on today is by far the most dangerous. It's about people with disabilities. That, that, that myth that disability ministry is about people with disabilities will trip up your ministry in the worst way. Everything we do as the people of God is about God. It involves people with disabilities, yes, but let me come to a passage that is crucial here. Romans chapter 1, verses 21 to 26. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Special needs ministry is not about the creature. It is about the Creator. When we talk about sharing the gospel with all nations, this is also a call to share Christ with every corner of our own nation. But it's not about the nations. It's not about our nation. It's not about people with disabilities. It's about Christ. Disability ministry and everything else that we do as His people is about God, not about disability or about people. Thank you for joining me today. The notes for this session, including all of the citations from scripture that I used and the studies I mentioned, can be found on the Inclusion Fusion website or at my blog, which is www.theworksofgoddisplayed.com. And finally, just as I opened with an invitation for you to join me in this conversation as I sat on my couch with my coffee, I would love to continue the conversation. Make it a two-sided one. My email address is shannon at theworksofgoddisplayed.com. I would love to set up a time to talk more about how you and your church can welcome and include people with disabilities. Also. If you are a parent and would like to pass my info along to church leaders at your church, please feel free to do so. God bless you, your family, and your ministry.